Hey guys, what's up? This is the live hangout that I posted about, about what, maybe 30 minutes ago? <laughs> maybe a little uh, more than that, almost 40, 50 <laughs> minutes ago. Um, sorry for the short notice about this, guys. This is entirely on me. I dropped the ball on this. Um, me and Hian here, um, he, we had wanted to do this for months, and then he finally told me he was ready to do it like a week ago. And I was so caught up with work that today, which was the day we were supposed to do it, I realized I never told anyone I was doing this. So don't feel bad if you missed this. For those of you guys who are watching this after this happened, don't feel bad. Um, and also, there might be some interruptions in the background because it's now 3 o'clock where I'm at and my son's going to be coming home from school. Hopefully he will keep it down, but <laughs> that, that, that's, that's my fault. Funny. Anyway, <laughs> this Hangout is going to be on Japanese swordsmanship and... As the title says, Myths and Misconceptions, though I kind of now regret putting that title. Because this is really more continuing off of the theme that I've been talking about recently, like with Scholagrim on his Hangout, as well as on my videos about this concept of honor in the martial arts and tradition and doing things a certain way, um, which kind of flies in the, the place of historical context, as well as the reality of what fighters and warriors actually are like. But first, let me introduce you to the person I'm talking to. Um, he goes by the name Hyun online, um, and he's he's left some really interesting comments under my videos, um, you know, on um, Japanese swordsmanship and just martial arts as a whole. And I find him to be a very knowledgeable individual. So we always have some really good discussions um, off YouTube, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to do this, you know, so long ago. So say hello to the people. Yahoo. Yeah. <laughs> nah. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I don't really know where to start right now because I, I don't usually make videos like online because, it, you know, honestly, I hate being caught up in like internet drama and stuff like that. Uh, like a couple of years ago, I did a YouTube series on that crazy Korean guy who pretends to be a ninja. Uh, and those got like around a thousand views or something like that, but in the end, I think I ended up getting like trolled or something by, by this guy, a bunch of people. Presumably, all like sock accounts of this guy started like spamming the the messages and stuff. I just felt okay. This I you know I have this compulsion. Maybe it's some kind of you know OCD or stuff like that. If I'm involved in some sort of discourse online, then I feel compelled to sort of carry it out to the end. If you know what I mean, and to sort of reply mm -hmm. to everybody and give everybody a fair shot. But I don't have time for that because I have, you know, work and stuff like that, and I can't be bothered to sit online all day and answer people. So it just came to the point where I just sort of stopped making videos. And uh, yeah, and also I'm not a native speaker of English, so you know, if I end up sitting here and saying mm and and, uh, and reusing the phrase "ick" and stuff like that all the time, then uh, just please excuse me. Don't. Don't bother bringing that up in like the comments or something like that because that's just the way I am. I can't help that. All right, well, yeah. don't worry about that. I mean, sheesh, there are people so in this country right now. Yeah. <laughs> there are people in this country right now, native English speakers, who can't speak all that well. So don't worry about anybody holding it against you. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, I feel your pain about the Korean ninja dude. I know exactly who you're talking about, and I'm pretty sure the people watching this right now know exactly who you're talking about, and I remember those years. So that was a crazy time on YouTube. Um, <sighs> because that was going on at the same time as yeah. all the atheist stuff blowing up, and that was a freaking crazy freaking time. Yeah. I mean, that was a, it's the whole maze of YouTube. Yeah. It's, but let's, get, let's stick to the subject at hand. Um, Keon here happens yeah. to have trained in Japanese martial arts and Japanese swordsmanship, which is why... Um, Usually when I need um, correction on something or if I need a little bit, this is the dude that I go to. And um, I figure that he'd be the perfect person to bring in with this conversation about um, concepts of honor in Japanese martial arts and Japanese swordsmanship and what samurai really were like during that time period. Um, I just wanted to start off... Well, before I even start off, um, I forgot to do this in the very beginning. Shout out to Demo Man Chaos and... Um, Neo Corpse. I know Neo Corpse, you changed your name on YouTube, but it's still Neo Corpse to me. Shout out to those two. Um, I've been talking to them recently, and hopefully I'll be having a hangout with them pretty soon. Now let's get on with this. Lights, oh my god. Oh. Um, the main thing I wanted to start off with is the um, concept of Japanese swordsmanship being tied specifically to honor and honorable behavior. 
Um, you happen to see this a lot with modern day um, practices of Japanese swordsmanship, whether it be Aido or Kenjutsu, even Kendo, even though it's more of a sport, but you tend to see um, more of um, this sort of like very ritualistic way of practicing it, a certain way that you're supposed to move, a certain way you're supposed to use the sword, and all the ceremony around that. And I'm not, this is not knocking all that. I believe that there is a purpose to it, uh, you know, a, um, there's a reason behind it. But I think that a lot of people get caught up in that ceremony and the honor of how to use a sword and kind of forget about the practicality of swordsmanship, period, what it was about, and the fact that the people who actually use these arts to, you know, protect themselves or to take other people out weren't necessarily all that interested in the ceremony of it uh, and were more interested in the practicality of it. So um, if you have anything uh, to add to that. Yeah, I, th I, yeah. I, I think the fir first thing I think most people should be aware of is that uh, a lot of the ceremonies surrounding Iaido practice and Kenjutsu practice and things like that probably weren't even there when these styles first uh, came into existence back in like the olden days when uh, the first Japanese people sat down and started codifying or uh, giving structure to uh, to their art so to speak if you had a swordsman who you know, survived a certain number of battles or something like that, or gained a certain reputation for being good at fencing, and he established his own school and he started creating his uh, his style, his curriculum, so to speak. I don't think that at that point they would have had a, a lot of these uh, uh, ritualized uh, sort of movements and meditation and things like that. A lot of that, I think, has been added afterwards in order to give uh, the style. Uh, an artsy flair to it, or make it more artistic, and it it's kind of in the word martial arts. I never really liked that word. Not that you can't view like the the study of combative disciplines art. Of course, anything can be art. The problem is that often people get attached to the term art, and suddenly it's not the martial part of it that uh, has the emphasis anymore when you think about it. It's the art part of the term and uh, artistry surrounding it and I think that's problematic for lo lots of reasons and it's even more problematic in a historical context when you can find many historical documents written by um, contemporary warriors from different periods who lament the exact same problem. who are like, why are all these warriors so obsessed with drinking tea and and sitting in sasen and meditating instead of instead of sweating in the dojo and you know duking it out so a lot of these things have been added later and Japan like China and Korea and most other Asian countries who had cultural revolutions have had you know periods where their arts have been sort of uh, suppressed or forgotten or ignored or become like minority practices and and then you get this nationalist movement who want to sort of bring back the, the you know the good old days and then they find these cultural artifacts and they elevate them to a positions to positions that they never really had to begin with and you see that all the time so uh, I think people need to sort of realize that even the classical Japanese arts as they are practiced today are not necessarily accurate reflections of uh, whatever those arts happened to be when they were f first, you know, realized or first structuralized by the samurai who invented these arts to begin with. Hmm. That's a good point. And you actually also see parallels of this with Chinese martial arts, in fact, a lot of parallels. Um, I've stated this before in older videos of mine that in when Chinese martial arts were in their heyday, when people were you know training to fight in order to put food on the table, um, you saw that they weren't really all that highly regarded, and this concept of the enlightened warrior monk, warrior sage, didn't really exist unless the person themselves happened to have had that type of personality. But by and large, most of the martial arts back then were just like any other working stiff who were using, who had a trade using their hands, and in this case it was using their hands on other people. You know, they have a rather, you know, I hate to say it like, a, you know, a, a working class, hard-nosed mentality. 
And in a culture like China, which tend to accentuate more the poetic arts, music, a certain way of cultivating yourself, especially after the, the Confucianistic um, teachings began to get spread apart, these people weren't really highly regarded. I mean, their skills were in terms of legendary stories and all that, but as you know, as an individual, not really. And as time went on and martial arts began to get less and less needed in society, at least in the way it was used using melee weapons or using hand-to-hand -hand techniques, and the hand-to-hand -hand techniques is more on the civilian side of things. Um, when you know the advent of the gun came about and when people had better ways of transportation and all that, suddenly these guys need to find some other way to make their money. You had street performers who were considered the lowest of the low. You had um, people who started, you know, talking about weird mystical energies that they were able to do with their, their techniques, which was complete garbage. And it was something that was lamented by real martial artists. If you, like, actually look at old um, documents and old stuff that was written in China during that time, like, who the, they were like, who the hell are these charlatans showing up talking about, or they can do this? Now it's about, you want to build strength, do some freaking push-ups, lift weights. Like, that, that's... They were arguing about that, but this was during a time period where they were in the decline and no one was really listening to them. They'd rather listen to the person who says all you need to do is drink tea and breathe a certain time amount of times per day and all of a sudden you get powers. And by the time you had... The funny thing was martial arts was really in a decline until around the Republican era in China when suddenly they saw what was going exactly. on in Japan during the Meiji era and you know the modernization of China when they kind of brought back their own concepts of Bushido and suddenly China was like, hey, we're looking like the weak people here. F that. We need to have our own nationalistic pride and, and, and nationalistic um, um, bringing back about our warrior arts. And so all of a sudden there was this huge influx of trying to teach martial arts to the, the, the common people, which was interesting because before that time period they weren't trying to teach everybody. You know, people who were martial arts were very, very selective on who they brought in as students and, you know, and, who they, and even on their students who they were going to pass on their best techniques to. Then suddenly in the Republican era, it's like, no, no, teach everybody because we need to show that we're a strong, mighty Asian nation too. So you suddenly saw a whole lot of like um, government-sponsored kung fu manuals being pushed out, a lot of researchers being done in modernizing their art. People are surprised to know that they even incorporated boxing into their techniques as early as like the early 1900s because they were looking at what everyone else was doing and saying, oh, this is really effective. This is an effective way of punching. Let's put that in art. Like All this was supposed to soup them up. And then you had the Cultural Revolution, which kind of threw all that out the window, and they're like, F all this ancient stuff, screw it. And so anybody practicing Kung Fu, well, okay. if you were in mainland China, good night. That's why there was, to this day, that's, there's a reason why you find so many really damn good hard-nosed martial artists in Taiwan. Yeah, they do exist in mainland China, but a lot of them tend to be either wushu guys or people who weren't able to like fully focus. And I'm speaking in general terms here. I know there's some really good ones there, but they had to hide. They didn't have to hide in Taiwan, so they really flourished over there, which is why a lot of masters we know of in the U.S. came from Taiwan. Um, and nowadays, you know, with how martial arts is popular, and I happen to think that part of it is because of the popularity of martial arts in the West. Now China is once again like, oh, martial arts is awesome, martial arts is great, you know, we're promoting it, look at all the money we're giving to Shaolin, look at all the money we're giving to Wudan. But what a lot of people don't seem to realize is that much of what people are practicing now, to kind of get back to the point that Hian brought up, these are reconstructed arts. And in fact, a lot of these martial arts were reconstructed exactly. over and over again. And the way people are practicing them now doesn't necessarily reflect the way they were practiced in the past, even though people say, well, this is a traditional way to do it. To a certain extent, if you're not, I'm going to just put it to you this way. Yeah. If you're practicing a Chinese martial art and you're not doing things like constantly sparring, lifting weights, body conditioning, you're not really practicing it in the way that people who are using it to keep themselves alive are practicing it. Um, and if you're not putting, another thing I have to say is if you're not putting a weapon component into whatever martial art that you're training in the Chinese martial art, and if that weapon component doesn't itself talk about usage, have you sparring, have you conditioning to use a weapon properly, then you're definitely not practicing it the way it was back then, because back then weapons were king. The barehanded stuff happened afterwards and flourished in a society that didn't necessarily have access to these military tools. Exactly. That's true for, like, all, all countries, I guess. The thing about unarmed martial arts is that if you're a warrior, uh, almost regardless of time period, you're going to have a primary weapon, which is going to be, like, a bow, a sword, or a... Um, or a bear or something to that effect, and then you're going to have a sidearm, which, going, which is going to be a, sword, a short sword or a dagger, um, 
or a knife or something to that effect, and then you're probably going to have some extra weapons hidden up your sleeve, who knows, like other hidden blades or something like that, or and you're going to be wearing like protective gear, like armor and things like that, and you're going to be fighting back to back or side to side with other people who are going to be fighting in a cohesive group with you. So the extent of which you have any need for unarmed combat is uh, is very marginal, to be honest. And if you're, you know, spending more time on learning how to fight unarmed as the person who's not wearing armor, then that is time wasted that you should have been spent on learning how to use the pro your primary weapons and, of course, group cohesion tactics. So. Uh, uh, Unarmed combat is always going to be a secondary or, like, I don't know, like, a really far-out priority to anyone who knows anything about armed combat. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that I've always hated the argument that I hear some people make when they say, like, well, this martial art was, like, uh, made on, you know, on battlefield experience or something like that, because martial art is such a minor thing in history like hit, like historical studies in and of themselves usually deal with you know major political events and things like that so uh, the life of the martial artist and the things that the martial artist did is such a small like not very well documented thing to be honest you you hear about mm. wars and large scale military operations but you don't really hear all that much in history in recorded history about the lives of you know, the foot soldier yeah. on on the battlefield. Like, what techniques did he use? Uh, the only thing you have to go by at that point is, of course, um, you have some general like historical accounts, and then you have testimony. You know, personal testimony, which is the shittiest kind of evidence you could possibly <laughs> have. And then you have that kind of evidence being, you know. Uh, you have testimony of testimony of testimony because you have these traditions, right, where the old grandmaster told his new student that, you know, back in the days we did it this way, and then this new student grows up to be a grandmaster one day, and then he tells the new student, you know, that's how they did it back in the day, and it keeps on going and going and going. So it, you really don't have any evidential, uh, like, uh, you don't have, like, the proper evidentialist framework to be able to make that assumption in a, like, safe and uh, constructive manner. All you really have to go by is, yeah, it's, uh, it's personal testimony, and people should learn to be sort of critical of that. And mm -hmm. if you look at, like, the historical facts that you do know, like the stuff that, for instance, on um, combat is generally a civilian's art, for instance, and when you consider that... Uh, Kendo, for instance, the the use of the shinai, the the four bamboo sticks that are uh, put together with leather or what, uh, whatever, and uh, and the bogu, the armor, the kendo armor, both of these pieces of equipment were introduced because people were beating each other silly with the fucking bokto, right, with the bogu, <laughs> with the uh, with the wooden. Next, because there were too high, like the that the, the accident rates, the injury rates were too high for mm. like, safe practice with uh, the wooden swords. So they introduced this, uh, these, uh, 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 you know, this new equipment in order to stop that. And that question that if they were only doing kata or um, or like. Uh, Predetermined sort of pattern and four movements. Why? Why would there be any high? You know, it's it's not like there are high injury rates in modern sections of kendo. No, in kenjutsu. So how can you, how can you make the argument that there? Yeah, it's 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 a completely. Uh, it's not uh, very well thought through. I think that kind of argument and even. Even the thing is that the sort of uh, the sort of uh, what's what's the term for it like the the sort of dualism that you see here in a lot of Western cultures where you have like oh traditional martial arts here traditional training methodology here and then you have modern training methodology here and modern martial arts. Mm -hmm. Firstly, most Japanese people who practice these don't think like that. Most people I know in Japan who practice Kenjutsu practice Kendo at the side because they know that they're not going to develop the proper timing and spacing for using a sword simply by practicing forms. Mm -hmm. Similarly, people who practice Kendo in Japan know that they're not going to learn how to cut by simply practicing Kendo, so they practice Iaijutsu or Kenjutsu on the side and practice with a live blade. Yeah. Because the two, the two, uh, the two arts. They, they, um, you know, you know, they. Uh, they complement you know, each other. 
uh, what's the word for it? They, that's right. That's the <laughs> word. That's the problem with speaking with a non-native speaker of English. You forget <laughs> stupid words like that. They complement each other, and uh, uh, and you know, I think that's um, it, it's really strange that if if only you spent like one year in Japan, you practiced with some of these people, you would know this, but. Uh, it's yeah, it's strange like, how aborted the Western reality of Japanese arts is from the Japanese understanding of Japanese arts, and I find that fascinating. It's uh, well, it's the difference I think between somebody who grows branding, up. Yeah. yeah, it's the difference between somebody who grows up with a particular thing and a group of people who they look at it as some something that's exotic, and therefore they wanted to keep that weird mysticism to it, so they end up giving it distinctions and separations that it shouldn't have. Um, by the way, before I go on, I'm noticing that I'm getting some questions. Um, unfortunately, the questions are coming through my email and not through the sidebar. We actually, <laughs> for those people who are in um, who are in the, the Hangout right now who are viewing this, I do have a question and answer app that's set up. So if there's any questions that you guys have, which we're going to try to answer toward the end of this, um, put your questions there. Because there is a really good chance that as we do this conversation, I might miss your question because it's going through the email. It was only because I happened to have been checking my email because of work-related stuff that I happened to notice that some stuff was coming through. Um, but th we do have an app there, a, a QA app. So if there's any questions you guys have, just use that app, and we'll try to answer them as you know much as possible toward the end of this. Um, though to answer one person's question real quick, because um, it's the main one I got. Um, Terry Miles asked, do I do a form of wushu? Um, basically, the main form I'm practicing right now is bagua. What I used to um, focus on before was long fist and a little bit of wing chun. These days, I'm focusing a bit more on bagua, but I'm trying to keep up with my long fist as well. So, anyway. Um, Man, can't you just migrate to singing? I want you to migrate to singing. <laughs> uh, you know, I like shingi, but um, the problem is I, am not, I was not around people who knew the style. I was uh, the the people I was around were people who knew long fist. The guy who beat the living crap out of me when I first learned Chinese martial arts was a Wing Chun guy. And then when I moved out to Indiana, the guy out here knew that I had a liking of Bagua, and he knew Bagua and taught me the first couple of poems. And I just branched out from there. Um, I don't know anybody who knows Xing Yi. And as much as I will say that if you have a really good background in a martial art, if you decide to pick it up on a video or a book, especially these days, teachers are doing a really good job with training tools where if you are dedicated enough and you are like literally working at least three hours a day in front of that thing, you can probably get the foundation for that. I don't really have the time for that sort of stuff anymore with my new job. Plus, Xing Yi, the way it moves is a little bit different from the way my other arts go. And so, I mean, I'm, maybe one day I might dabble with a couple of fists here and there, but I, I don't see myself mastering or I shouldn't even say master. I don't even see myself being able to basically understand that style anytime soon. It would be cool. I like Shingy. I just <laughs> not my thing. Anyway, um, yeah, there was I like some, it too. yeah. There's one thing that I wanted to get on that I think that you can really help to clear up for me and also to um, educate the audience a bit, and that's on the focus on the katana okay. in Japanese martial arts. It is always. I mean, I, I kind of have the answer. I, I kind of have an idea why this has happened, but I still would rather hear it from somebody who's actually you know studied in Japan and knows the culture and such. Um, I've always found it funny that there's so much focus on the katana in terms of Japanese samurai arts. Like when people think of the samurai, they instantly think of the katana. But the funny thing is, when you research the samurai and how they came about, their first, the weapon that they used to love using all the time was the bow. The bow and arrow on horseback was one of the main weapons that and they the used. And the And also the, the yari, the spear. Those were the two main weapons that they used on the battlefield. And the main sword that they used to use was the tachi, which is not a katana. It may look like one at first glance to people, but it's more of a cavalry weapon with a deeper curve. Now, as yeah. time went on, their sidearm, which is exactly what a sword is, it's a sidearm, became the katana, and it became more associated with them. And I'm assuming it's probably because during the peacetime era, those were weapons they were allowed to carry. That's the one they were allowed to use. There was no war for them to use the bow and arrows and such. But it's still kind of funny to me how the focus these days is mostly on the katana. You don't find many people who want to get into Japanese martial arts weapons. Oh, wow, I want to learn how to use the tai chi. I want to learn how to use the yari. No, they, they, I want the katana, and that's the main focus. That's where all the stuff that seems to be focused on. And it seems to me, even in Japan, 
the focus is on that weapon. So I was wondering what insights you can um, bring to that. And I'll delve into it. Uh, okay. General have always had a certain role in like Japanese culture and in Japanese like folklore for that. And so you have like the uh, you know it's been a while since I was in the university now and I did my studies in Japanese history. But uh, you have like the three ancient artifacts or something that w one of them is a sword. Um, mm. A lot of their old like Shinto legends and things like that. Uh, yeah, around, so, yeah, so or around that sword, if I'm not much mistaken. So yeah, so they've always had like a, a culture for swords there and. Um, I think that it, it become even more like ingrained in the Japanese uh, social spirit, if I can if I can use that term, uh, with uh, when it became the symbol of the samurai, which uh, pretty much uh, by the start of the Tokugawa era, I think a little bit before that, when you know carrying the sword became what essentially identified the person as a samurai, the ability to carry the sword, the right to carry the sword, mm. and. Uh, it's it's the kind of uh, the the katana itself the um, more or less modern not so modern of course but the more or less modern worse, uh, version of the katana it, it it emphasis it has an emphasis on balance right because like you said it's it's um, it's a derivative of the of the sword of the cavalry uh, but the katana is made so that it has like it's not quite the the sword of the cavalry but it's uh, a straight sword, either. It has like mm. it, it. It's like they tried to put as many properties into one blade as possible in order to make it as uh, as versatile as a sort of uh, as possible for like a weapon that you would carry at all times and all social, you know, in all social situations. And uh, uh, I think that uh, there are, you know, you have this cultural component, you have this historical component, and then you have uh, the, even if it wasn't the primary weapon on the actual battlefield, it was you know it was carried by uh, by the commanders, of course. Uh, it was carried by practically uh, everyone of higher rank, and um, and they would carry it with them uh, during even during times of peace, of course. Uh, they would always be carrying them, so it's just become, I guess the natural assumption that this is the thing that you would be focusing on if you're trying to sort of, I don't know, understand the samurai or learn samurai arts. Of course, there are many styles still focus on on other kinds of weapons. If you practice the Katori Shintoryu, for instance, you will learn the use of, the, I think it's the Naginata and maybe the Adi as well. Um, and uh, you still find girls in Japanese high schools who practice uh, who practice uh, you know, not yari but the naginata, which is the the ha Japanese halberd, I guess. It's uh, it's a uh, it's shorter than the yari, and then it has a blade at the end. And um, this is really popular, like or it's really popular is an exaggeration. I don't think no, any martial art is really popular in Japan compared to things like street dance or baseball, but. Um, you know, you'll have a lot of girls in old girls' schools who practice uh, naginata, which is traditionally thought of as uh, as a, as a, the uh, a, a women's weapon, or all you know, all all the the higher up females of the samurai class would learn how to use. Uh, or you know, I shouldn't exaggerate. Of course, there would be exceptions, but a lot of them would learn how to use the uh, naginata in order to protect the home. So you can still find a lot of arts in, J in Japan that don't emphasize primarily on the sword. The, the Japanese, I think it's, uh, I can't remember the name of the organization, but it's like the biggest organizations for organization in Japan for the practice of uh, various kinds of traditional weaponry. They have uh, many like places dedicated primarily to the use of like the the bow and the jaw and you know different kinds of staffs and things like that. So uh, the 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 obsession, especially of the West, with the sword, really has a lot to do with popular culture and you know and 
a combination of Japanese nationalism and uh, West Orientalism and things like that. It's not necessarily a... It's, it's a combination of a lot of different factors. It's a difficult question to give a straight answer to. I'm sorry if I can't narrow it more down. Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, it's, it, I guess because my particular belief... I mean, I've seen some proof of this. There's some historical context to this in many different cultures. But it's, it just seems to me that since the sword is a personal sidearm... And it's the one sidearm that the warrior classes in so many different societies got to carry in everyday life. Um, it since it became this symbol, that became the main thing that they're associated with. That's the thing that we've romanticized. Exactly. And since it's the main thing we've romanticized about them, and they happen to be the group of people that growing up many people wanted to be like, that's the main weapon that we want to use and train it. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. That's when I was growing up as a kid. The reason why I was so focused on the sword is because. My fate, the books I was reading, the cartoons I was watching, the kung fu movies I was constantly watching because I grew up with a war child because the Shore Brothers helped me, um, raise me up. Um, it was always a sword, and I was fascinated by it and by its use. Exactly. And that's what I wanted to learn how to use. Um, though, speaking of the sword and I stuff like that, oh, yo, are you going to say something? No, I just said it's also worth me that prior to the first Mongol uh, invasion of Japan or the attempted invasion of Japan, uh, before they get to uh, modern, quote unquote, uh, military tactics, uh, the uh, I'm not going to say this like uh, as scholars. Uh, I don't have the sources for this right now, and I might be remembering this wrong. So take a grain of salt. But I'm pretty sure that prior to the first Mongol in invasion of Japan or attempted invasion, then the Japanese fought a lot like the early Vikings did, which is like they would ride to the battlefield, they would then disembark, they would wander onto the uh, priorly agreed field of battle, and then they would stand there and they would shout out their name and their rank, and they would be equal name and rank, and then they would fight each other one on one, and then when one of them died, move on, and they would keep on butchering each other like that until uh, you know one of the armies were decimated, and have any concept of moving it of, of group cohesion or or guerrilla warfare or anything like that. And so, uh, period. If I'm not much mistaken, the primary weapon was sword. So it's not inconceivable that even after the introduction of different modern or you know quote unquote modern uh, Chinese battlefield tactics or Mongolian battlefield tactics when the swords then sort of had a fashion on the battlefield, they would still sort of glory sword because that's what their ancestors used to mm. do honorable battle and, uh, you know, these are the kind of stories that they would tell each other and, you know, that's the kind of culture they would glorify, so it's not um, that also might have had a large impact on the value of the sword in Japanese culture even after that period ended. Yeah, that, okay. That, yeah, I could definitely see that. That, that definitely makes sense. Um, actually, now that we're of talking course. about swords... At that, so time, <laughs> at that time, they weren't using a katana, of course. <laughs> they weren't using katanas at that point, uh, yeah. of course. So, yeah. So, but since we're talking about swords and... <laughs> you know, myths and misconceptions. I think this would be a really good idea to then go into some of the misconceptions about the sword arts and the techniques themselves, especially in pertains to honor yeah. and proper behavior in how to fight somebody. Um, you and I have had a lot of private conversations. We had a lot of private conversations and laughs at some of the techniques that are taught these days in a very ritualistic fashion. And people talk about, you know, they have their own... Um, interpretations of, oh, you, this technique is to do this, that, that, and this. When you actually look at the practical application, it's really straight up assassinating somebody or butchering somebody. And, you know, yeah. and, and really, if you think about it, in straight up combat, you're trying to kill the other dude and trying to take advantage of him. And many of the, even some of the more fairly recent, relatively recent treatises on Japanese swordsmanship, tell you to do things like, for instance, stand with the sun at your back so you blind your opponent when you're coming at, um, exactly. at him, or you know, find ways of using the terrain against him and things like that. So I guess this will be a really good idea to then talk about exactly it's been, uh, exactly um, what, how exactly did samurai behave in combat 
and how do the techniques that people are training in even these days reflect that behavior and what they were actually like? Before I go into that, I think the most important thing to emphasize is that I don't think that there is any Japanese, currently existing Japanese uh, art, uh, art of swordsmanship that truly reflects how samurai fought in the battlefield, uh, at least not after, as I said, the first Mongolian where they first um, gained knowledge of like uh, uh, group cohesion in combat, because at the end of the day, if you're fighting shoulder to shoulder with another person or back to back with a squad, then the way that you fight is completely different than from how you would fight in a one-on-one -on -one match where you have room for movement around you and you don't have to worry about you know, dead bodies or stepping on things uh, like broken pieces of equipment and stuff like that. So uh, naturally, for instance, if you're fighting in team and another one, and you, you'll find a lone target and then one person will move in first and then he'll essentially just trap the sword or whatever, or the spare of the opponent with his own weapon and then keep the two intertwined or locked to each other and then allow his companion to flank the other guy and cut him down or stab him or whatever. Uh, and, you know, practicing that would be a natural part, I think, of any warrior's training regimen. And that kind of practice is non-existent in any kind of more modern, you know, school of fencing, whether I think it's Chinese or Japanese or whatever. And that just shows exactly how far removed any of these arts are from actual battlefield training. It's it's like comparing a, f a shooting on the firing range with the sort of the military tactical games that soldiers engage in in order to practice war in the modern U.S. military or something like that. The two are um, not comparable at all. But even if if you start looking at the techniques, as I said, you do, it's strange how people try to rationalize the sort of honor surrounding, for instance, Iaijutsu techniques, which is ex essentially the art of quick drawing, because you don't really even have to look at the techniques. I know we've talked a lot about the techniques earlier, and I've mentioned things like the uh, the technique in some of the more common Iaido styles, where you will be pushing a crowd aside and cutting down the target at the other side of the crowd. <laughs> that, that's one example, of course. but. But you don't really even need to look at that. You only need to look at the very existence of Iaijutsu as a style that people practice. Because Iaijutsu as a style implies a certain thing about the society that you live in. It either implies that you are defending yourself against people who are preemptively attacking you, or it means that you're attacking somebody preemptively. How you look at it, somebody is attacking preemptively, and that means that either your attacker or you are breaking the rules of conduct. In other words, somebody in that society doesn't give a fuck about, you know, square fight, <laughs> you know, the shouting about challenges. So it's either the guy's attacking you or it's you, but if, if you really need to have to develop a specific set of skills in order to protect yourself from people jumping out of bushes and attacking you, that says something about the society that you live in. So you can't really wrap that concept around the concept of uh, honorable behavior in terms of the samurai. It simply doesn't work. Uh, if you need the Ijitsu either to attack or to defend yourself, that means that somebody, either you or the other guy, is already breaking the rules of conduct. So, okay. Actually, there's I a guess, even uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, you bring up some really good points, and that is actually one of the things about Ijitsu that I think is quite apparent about exactly how these people really act, and especially. To me, the whole fact that you're making a stroke immediately from pulling the sword out implies to me that you are either having to attack the person mm. under duress, so you need to minimize your attack as possible, or you're trying to quickly take out the other dude before he even is aware of the fact that you're trying to cut him down. Because just the minute you pull the thing out, that's an attack. That goes against any notion that we may have of yeah, possible so. dueling where the person pulls out the blade and then readies themselves. No, it's just straight up cut. You know, either you're doing that because somebody's jumping after you, and you're exactly. oh man, I need to like immediately, efficiently get my blade out and at the same time counter, or at the same time, you know, you're pulling the thing out to take them down before they're even aware of what you're doing. Um, that's not, you know, I'm, forget about our concepts of honor. Even the, the concepts of honor that we, that we are told that they had, or even they themselves might say that they had, that kind of goes against that way of thinking. Um, actually, uh, and we're mentioning that the rules of conduct that they said they had is not really the rules of conduct 
that, that they said they had, a lot of people derive their idea of the rules of conduct of samurai based on, for instance, the book called Bushido by Inazo Mitobe, which, uh, uh, which is stupid because he lived at like the end of the 18th century and he was a Christian and he didn't know shit about samurai. So uh, it's like that doesn't even make sense to begin with. And if you read stuff written by contemporary samurai, uh, who lived in the Warring States period, or even the early Sengoku period, and now the early uh, Tokugawa periods, and things like that? Uh, their view on what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do is completely different from what you would find, for instance, in modern books written by Japanese people about samurai. So it, it's not even coherent with. You know, with historical facts about how what the samurais actually said in their respective periods about how to behave, these are conceptions of modern Japanese people about how samurais behaved after a outbreak of nationalism at the uh, onset of the Meiji period. So it's um, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's out of touch with reality. Um, another myth that we can get into is the power of the swords themselves and the men who were able to use them. Um, I said I was going to be answering questions at the end, but one question came in from Whirling Wolves that I think really ties into this discussion that we're having. Um, he asks, okay. he says, what's the truth of katana blades being tested by how many people you can cut in half with one stroke? It always smelled like bullshit to me. For one, bone is denser than concrete, yes? So no matter how you angle the stroke of your cut, you'd be trying to cut through quite a significant amount of bone material that's denser than concrete, right? Well, A, wouldn't this gravely damage the blade being tested, and B, require superhuman strength to do so? Um, before I have you answer this question, um, one thing I do want to say about here is that I don't... Um, I think when they were trying to cut... At least the way it was explained to me, when they were cutting people in half, supposedly, or checking how deeply they can cut into the dude, I think it was more like they just wanted to see how well the sword could cut, not necessarily how well, it could cut them in half. I could be wrong about that, but that's the way it was explained to me. And also, that um, the, the problem is, I think that they always dealt with one person at a time. I don't know if they had like, a bunch of people in a row and they tried to cut through all of them at once. I'm not so sure if that's the way you meant in the question. I don't think it is, but just in case it was, I think if they had to do it one person at a time. And I think they tested different parts of the body. Like, they cut up like an arm and they cut like a, a, a leg. Or they cut like into the, the torso just to see how well it cut in. But... Um, let me, again, pass the floor on to Hyun, who would probably know more about this than I did. Uh, let's see how it compares somewhere. Uh, wait two seconds, and I'll see if I find a picture of sword, Japanese sword testing. Uh, where is it? It's a rather bruised picture, but it's not that bad. I guess it's still safe for work. Well, uh, firstly... There are a lot of different, like, <laughs> testing the sword. It's like some some samurai, when they would test the sword, would just, you know, they would just walk outside at night and then find some people belonging to a class of people known as the eta. Eta is uh, lower than trash, essentially, essentially, in Japanese society. People who... who who, uh, who work there, and the slaughtering of animals and stuff like that. And essentially, these people, just by being seen by a samurai, could be killed for breaching etiquette. So um, they were supposed to not be heard or not even be, like, you know, in, in vicinity of people of higher social standing. And um, essentially, I think there would be people who, who, when they tested their swords, they would just sort of walk out at night and they'd find some people in a lower social class and they'd just cut them down. Uh, I don't know if they would cut off their arms or their heads or they would just cut them to see if the blade could cut. Probably, I don't think they would be cutting the body in such a way as to damage the sword because you don't want that. Uh, again, take anything I say with a grain of salt because uh, I just can't be bothered to find the sources for this stuff at the moment. Another, uh, I'm trying to find a picture of the hair in one of my books, but um, supposedly some people would, they would tie a guy naked over like a mound of uh, sand shaped like a, you know, shaped kind of like this, so the body would be stretched over, and then they would be uh, tied with ropes, the ropes that we pegged to the ground. 
and then they would cut the guy at, at the at the door as um, as uh, Sword Sage just said earlier, and uh, so they would be standing like um, at the side, and they would cut down across the torso. That's the like instances of sword testing on on live bodies. Uh, some people would probably cut down criminals or something like that as well. I I'm not entirely sure about that, but it's it's quite possible. But uh, I don't think uh, they would ever like touch you know test the sword more than once or things like that. That doesn't seem relevant. Uh, and I'm not really sure how much of it is actually about testing the durability of a sword uh, as much as it, it, it is about uh, sort of baptizing the sword. It's the idea that this, you know the sword has a spirit and stuff like that, and the sword needs to sort of be baptized by cutting something before it, you know, before it can be used properly or whatever. There are like ah yeah, here we have a nice picture. I don't know if it. Uh... Yeah, I can I can barely I can see it. It, it it's basically um, coming out well, and also and for anybody else um, who wants a clearer picture, I do have uh, I can share a screen right now of a page on Japanese test cutting, where you can see um, like all the different angles that they cut into, um, as well as why they cut into there. And it was more like just test cutting blades that were just newly made, but. I noticed that they're not necessarily talking about like cutting the person in half. It's just more like how well can the person, you know, just cut into them and how well, it, you know, how well it does doing that. Let me quickly, let me see if I can share a screen real quick for the audience. Um, hold on for a second. And can you see that? You should always take this book. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, I know this. Now, as you, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving around, but um, basically, you know, but the, ah, so I do have to go over here. Whoops. Okay, so here you can see all the different angles that they would be testing to cut through, and I'm thinking with all these freaking lines, I, I don't care how well the blade is made. I don't think that they're expecting somebody to be able to chop them up, you know, completely through them that fine. I'm thinking it's more like, you know, okay, well, maybe this is a lop off a hand, which is not hard to do with a good, well-made sword. At the elbow, again, you notice the wrist here is a joint. The elbow there is a joint. You got, like, the, the usual diagonal cut, you know, cutting through the collar, like, the collar area, the neck down, down out to the side of the stomach, um, and then many side ones to the knee, to the ankle. These are smaller areas that they're cutting into them. I don't think it's, like, to straight up cleave them in half. It's more um, to... You know, just test how well it can cut, if it can cut into them at all, if it can cut deeply into them. Granted, this webpage that I'm showing you guys is, um, you know, judging sharpness and, and testing out the blades from specific swordsmiths who are um, renowned. Um, if you guys are interested, um, I'm looking at this at the Japanese sword index.com where they have the article right there. So if you want to check it out, that's where it is. Um, just right here, guys. Just also worth <laughs> mentioning that. that, of course, there's a very big difference between like the average uh, grunt on the battlefield and the sword that he used, and of course the uh, the properly made swords uh, made for the lords and things like that by renowned you know uh, swordsmiths. There is a high difference in quality when it comes to that. So uh, to 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 uh, uh, to think that the average uh, soldier in in a Japanese uh, in the Japanese system. With a katana, would bother testing it on material that might chip the blade is uh, is silly. I don't think that would happen. But if you notice, most of those lines, I, I think the idea of the lines is that they're always supposed to be at a joint or a place where uh, is it is it called cartilage in English? Uh, yeah, where cartilage. you know the bone is like weak, it's weak. It's uh, yeah. It's um. You're not supposed to cut at the places where it's more resistant. I'm guessing that the lines, for instance, that are crossing the upper body is supposed to be lines uh, in between, for instance, the rib cage. Not, not like. Uh, of course, you're supposed to avoid the large uh, bony portions of the body when you're testing it because you're testing it on flesh. Um, one last that thing. That being said, to... your sword needs a certain. It's you know. Sorry, I was gonna say one last thing. Also no, it's okay. To point out. Because as my wife pointed out, um, I think 
and asking the question about like how can somebody think of being able to cleave through bone when it's denser than concrete? Well, it's not really the density that um, would damage or stop a blade. I mean, density can help. But it's really hardness, and hardness and density are not necessarily the same thing. For instance, um, this water bottle here, the skin of it is not that dense, and I've cut through this just fine. However, tatami mats, which I've also cut through, I really need to start putting up videos of those, um, are denser than this, and I can cut through that just fine. Um, but concrete, I can't cut through, <laughs> and it's not as dense as um, some of this other material. It's, but the concrete is a lot harder than this other material. So it's, they're two different things. I know it may seem like it's not two different things, but it, functionally it is. It's more about, it's not necessarily about the density, though that can help to stop a blade, but it will, if the material itself is not that hard, it's still going to at least be able to get into it with a properly aligned stroke. You know, if you've got a good weight behind it, as well as the angling of it, you got to get it in there. And sometimes the blade doesn't even also a slab of concrete. Hard. A slab of concrete is completely different from a, a human bone. I mean, concrete. You, you can see people who practice some sort of unarmed martial art actually, you know, break concrete with their fucking hands just through like uh, the sh shock. I mean, that happens. And um, or is it not concrete? That maybe what? Uh, or do you call that concrete in? Uh, with Anywhere. bricks and cinder blocks? Yeah, but yeah, of course, cinder blocks, not concrete. But no, I refuse to believe that bones are anything close to, I mean, uh, concrete. I mean, have there is a reason if you get thrown to the fucking concrete that you're gonna break your bones, but they're not gonna, there's not gonna be any, you know, impact on the fucking concrete. If you get thrown to the concrete and you try to, for instance, catch yourself with your hand, your of course your wrist is going to break. But this, there's not going to be any marks in the fucking concrete after you fall on the floor or fall on the concrete. So that's a silly. I, I think that's silly. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, bones. You know, uh, one thing that many people seem to forget is that if you took a slab of concrete and put it on a table and try to hit it on a sword, of course the sword would break. But there is no part of your body. That has that kind of construction. I mean, bones are are thinner, smaller, and they're not connected to uh, a lot. If if you had like a massive piece of bone, like like a slab of concrete, then yeah, presumably you know you your your blade would break or whatever. But that's not how our bodies look. I mean, uh, the comparison is just really really strange. I see what the person was getting at with their question, though. Um, basically, the, the whole thing was, yeah. remember, the image of the katana is that somebody can use it to just completely cleave somebody in half, and we see that in movies, we see that in video games. But you don't really see that in reality. But that's the, you know, that's, you know, the myth that we, we get. And I'm pretty sure when you have somebody just lying, like, you know, if they're testing somebody who's just lying there, and you happen to have a particularly well-made blade, and somebody happens to be strong enough, who knows, maybe a cut that they made lengthwise against the torso, they might have gotten a good whack right to the spine where, you know, you didn't go to the rib cage, you just went to where the guts are. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's separating them happens to the spine. And that's exactly what you, you, you aim at. You, when they do that kind of blade test, the body is strung like this, so it's bent mm -hmm. over and causes, you know, uh, stress on the torso, and they're aiming for the lower part of the stomach, mm -hmm. which is under the rib cage. So the only part it's going to go through is the spine, so, uh, and a bunch of guts. Yeah, which are not lat resistant. So, yeah, so you might be able to get somebody strong enough to do that, but that's not something that would be consistently happening on the battlefield. Or even forget battle, because no. I'm gonna say battlefield because of the armor. Of but even without the armor, you know, if you're fighting just somebody who's just simply wearing clothes, well, in order for you to be able to get a good cut like that, that guy pretty much has to just be standing there waiting for you to do it, and that rarely ever happens. Yeah, so, you know... And it doesn't even go into the fact that it isn't necessary to begin with because you don't need to cut a guy in half in order to kill him to begin with because if you give him a large cut somewhere, he's going to bleed death in matters, in matters of minutes anyway. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's one of those skills that you don't really need to begin with, like the skill of breaking cinder blocks or whatever. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not relevant. It's not yeah. relevant to how good yeah. you are fencing. It's just something to impress the noobs. Um, but we're... Oh wait, you're saying there is some amazing cutting. There is actually a guy on YouTube, uh, a clip of a Japanese guy who I actually think could probably cut a guy in half, and you can find it. It's like a guy with a nodachi. 
mm. who's cutting through a these they're like eight I think like um, eight times four like the Tommy mats end up in a, like a giant fucking lump. Damn. And he cuts little... through all of them from one side to the other. I really need to see more Nodaichi stuff. It's, it's, it's another it's, weapon it's I rarely ever see used. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have. I don't know anything like yeah, specifics about that, but I just thought it's like this old, really huge dude. He's like older, not that huge, but you know, like stocky, like stocky, <laughs> like a barrel, like a beer, like a bear, <laughs> like a, or like a keg of, or like a keg of beer. And he's kind of bald, and he has like this huge fucking nondachi, and he's just going to town with it. It's completely awesome. <laughs> All right, we're coming toward the end of this because I wanted this to not go longer than an hour. So before I get to the questions and start okay, looking okay. at those, um, are there any final things about Japanese swordsmanship that you feel needs to have some clearing up or anything that you want to impart? If you're going to learn anything about Japanese swordsmanship and you're interested in that, I would actually advise that you start out with kendo to be honest because that is going to teach you at least the rudimentary skills of how to hit someone else in the head with a stick or a sword while they're resisting and if you're going to practice Japanese swordsmanship I would um, like learning how to cut things I would recommend the Katori Shinto Ryu or Eiyu anything other than that outside of Japan is probably not going to be all that Good. And if you're interested in seeing like authentic Japanese horsemanship on YouTube, I would recommend a channel called uh, I think it's called Koga Sekido, which is like a K O G A Sekido. Uh, that's a great channel. A bunch of like Kenjutsu enthusiasts from Japan who um, who upload videos like every day, uh, every you know patterns and just. Hmm. General, so don't, don't hello. Don't okay. don't learn anything you find on YouTube these days, or Korean ninjas, or or shady kenjutsu <laughs> dojos. Uh, you know that you find on the street corner around the, the day. Just stop doing that. Stop doing that. Yeah, well, that's unfortunately. Um, I mean, I. I agree with you on people having to try to like do some research and try to find you know decent schools or decent instructors to learn how to do this stuff. But one, they're hard to find, and two, they're a lot more charlatans to find. I myself was very lucky that the Chinese martial arts I did pick up, I picked it up from people who were insane about fighting and were insane. Period. <laughs> but it's really hard to find, you know. That that's why. That's why kendo is such a short shot in my opinion. A lot of people just, oh, it's just a sport, it's not proper like Japanese swordsmanship and you have all these elitists in the state who practice things like Jinkan and things like oh, kendo is shit, but it's like if you if you start doing kendo then you know what you're going to get and you're going to get some uh, you know rough workout hours, you're going to be sweating a lot, you're going to be hitting each other ahead, in the head with wooden sticks or bamboo sticks and if you want to learn how to cut, then all you really have to do is, uh, like most people do, you know, buy a sharp plate and uh, go back into your, you know, go into your backyard and cut stuff because it, it, there's no magic around just cutting shit in half. And you can learn that pretty much by watching YouTube videos and being a bit, you know, uh, diligent with your practice. It's much harder to get, uh, it's much easier to find a kendo dojo and learn like the basics of timing and, and spacing and stuff like that uh, if you put in a couple of years than it is to find a authentic Japanese uh, kenjutsu or yaijutsu dojo that is going to teach you uh, not only how to look pretty in a bow tie while uh, flailing a, uh, a yaito but uh, <laughs> who's also going to teach you actual Japanese swordsmanship and an understanding of Japanese culture and his history beyond the sort of orientalist image that most of the people in the West have of Japanese history. Okay, since we're toward the end, um, there's another question that came in that I think is going to be a really good send-off to this. And again, it's by Terry. 
um, Terry Miles, who asks if there's a lot of truth to what we hear about samurai without masters or doing something dishonorable that they disembowel themselves. You know the whole seppuku thing. Um, like if a samurai supposedly um, did something wrong or you know shamed his master's name or shamed his family's name, that you know they would just do the whole belly slitting thing. Yeah. They do that. I mean, Japanese people today kill themselves uh, if if they felt if they lost face. I'm. I, you hear stories about during when the bubble burst back in uh, w when was it like uh, 1920s or whatever. If you'd have Japanese uh, businessmen who would, you know, they would refuse to go home to their families because you know they'd lost their jobs and they couldn't yeah. tell their families that they would lost their jobs and couldn't support them anymore and some of them would become homeless and some of them would just you know, jump in front of the train. But uh, what a lot of people don't seem to realize is that the, is the entire seppuku thing is not, not necessarily very often about honor. It's a political tool. It's a, it's a political tool for keeping samurai in check. Uh, it, it would that. often, more often than not, it, yeah, it more often than not, it would not be. Uh oh. Uh, two seconds, two seconds, I have to fix it. Okay. Um, actually, I'll take over a bit here, um, and then you can answer, you can continue on or correct any mistakes I would make. But that's something that I wanted to bring up the fact that a lot of times Sepulchre was used a little bit as kind of keeping the samurai in check and kind of, you know, you're just pretty much just keeping them check. It was a bit of a um, a political tool. Just, just, my, um, just my wife getting angry. Okay, um, but it's a, it was basically a way of like if you had certain samurai who were being a bit unruly, or if there were a certain group of people you need to get rid of, or you know for whatever reason. Because remember, exactly. samurai are straight up warriors. As I said in a video that I made before about supposed honor, in many different societies, you know European ones even Chinese ones or whatever, you, you have a group of people who their main set of skills revolve around breaking people apart. There's a certain mentality you have to have or that you end up developing when this is what you do for most of your life. And then when you take these same people and put them in a peaceful situation, it's kind of hard to keep them from you know wanting to use their skill set or kind of go nuts. It happens to be a certain segment that we still live with today. I'm pretty sure that some people might have heard a story about military guys who come home they have post-traumatic stress disorder, or they just, they got to be back in the field, and if they can't get back in the field, they end up doing some really harsh things. Like, I've, I've known people in the military who told me stories about, like, guys they knew who would, like, almost completely, you know, kill their wives because that rage was still there. It's something that we don't like to talk about, but it happens, and there's no reason to not think that you have these same type of people with that sort of aggressive personality or mentality in the past, especially with a much more personal, up and close style of fighting that they happen to have um, trained in. And if yeah. you have a group of these people that you can't control or you have reasons to believe that they might end up doing something that's going to disrupt society, you kind of have to find a way to get rid of them. And having something built into their, their, their code stating that they have to off themselves is kind of a neat way of doing it. It's Say, also, it's, when I said political tool, I I thought of it more like uh, um, it has a lot to do with uh, preserving your own political position uh, as opposed to not just, not necessarily preserving peace, but for instance, the, a lot of the edicts demanding that somebody take their own life would come from, for instance, uh, uh, the shogun or one of the higher lords to one of the lower lords in order to sort of hold them in check or you now you I, I see that you're doing some sort of political game here that is going to compromise my political power I don't like that so I'm going to find an excuse now to have you disembowel yourself because in that way I am not the one killing you so you know um, I don't have any blood on my hands <laughs> and uh, uh, it's not my fault, it's your fault, and you yeah. have to kill yourself. And uh, that way I can man maintain social order and social standing. And similarly, it was also used as a tool. Like, you could, for instance, have one of your samurai do something that you, uh, you know, so, some sort of dodgy side business that you uh, didn't really want to get, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't really want to come back to you, or you didn't, it didn't want <laughs> to have an effect on your political standing or name and then he would get caught and then your way of sorting of sort of uh, uh, 
uh, letting go of responsibility is to say, well, now you have to go and commit kill himself, seppuku, yeah. and kill himself, and then your name would be, you know, you would be whitewashed of any sort of uh, incriminating you know, or problematic stigma that could have uh, could have latched onto you from the acts of that samurai. So uh, it was a v very often just a tool used to uh, design uh, to sort of put blame or hide blame or simply. Uh, sort of protect the political status quo, and the samurai would do that because if they didn't do that, then yeah, then the would, alternatives were generally much worse. Like worse, having yeah. your entire like having your entire out. line uh, of <laughs> family line wiped out for all eternity and stuff like that. So yeah, and and that's what I meant by saying that it was a neat way of doing <laughs> it. I wasn't that. saying like neat as in oh it's. It's cool. It was more like it was a very, you know, tidy way of dealing with these situations. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it was, it's, yeah, it's sick. It's kind of effed up, but that's, it was a way of, of just like cleaning up your mess without even having to get your hands dirty. It's like you, you can send people out to do something that, get rid of this guy, and then after he gets caught in a scandal, oh, how dare you do that? Kill yourself. You know, or, you know, I see what you're doing over there, and if you don't want me to expose your plot, you might as well just chop your head over the <laughs> You know, so it's, it's a really messed up way of, you know, trying to keep order. I mean, when I was saying keeping the peace, I really meant keep order, but that was a really good point. All right, my job is now about to knock on the door. <laughs> I have swords I need to ship out, but um, yeah. I hope this um, Hangout has been informative and entertaining for you guys. It definitely was entertaining for me. I wish I could have made this go longer. You guys know me. I can do this for days. But um, I know some people don't like sitting here for an hour and a half, two hours, like a couple of my other Hangouts used to be. So I'm trying to keep it around an hour. But this is not going to be the only one that I do on these topics, and I'll do with stuff on other martial arts as well. And I'll have, I'll most likely have Hyun back as well as a couple of other people like Demo Man or maybe, um, who knows, I might get Skull over. Um, so um, I'm hoping you guys got to enjoy it. I tried to get everybody's questions. I think I got everybody. Um, for those of you who missed it, well, I'm sorry. I blamed that on me. Next time I'll try to do um, announce it earlier so you guys will be able to be here, or maybe I'll do it at a better time. And yeah, I hope you guys found this informative and you hope you enjoyed it. I thank Hyun for being here to share some of his knowledge with us. So you say goodbye. <laughs> Got any final yeah. things to add? I'm not, not a few words, or <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that after I've been talking for like an hour, but yeah. All right, guys. So I hope you guys I'm enjoyed it. I'm not good with guitars. <laughs> not me either. But anyway, I'll catch you guys later, and hope you guys enjoyed it. Yeah. Take care. See you guys. Toodaloo.